All right. Um, so what I wanted to start out by talking about today is that we do have an exam coming up in this class. And the first exam will be, um, let's see, I guess today's Wednesday, right? So a week from today. And partially also on Friday, depending on which group you're in, if you're in like the A group, the B group, or the C group. Uh, and I'll tell you on our review day, which will be Monday, and I'll also send out an email saying who will be taking the test on what days. Um, so in terms of next week, Monday will be a review day. Uh, so we'll just have class as normal uh, if you come or if you're watching. And that will be a review. And then Wednesday and Friday will both be the exam. So. If you're not taking your exam on that day, you just are good to go. You don't have to do anything that day. Okay, so um, we have this assignment over continuity, and then we'll have two more assignments. Uh, one assigned today that's due Friday, one assigned Friday that's due Monday, and that will be the stuff that's on the first exam. Okay, uh, and I'll talk more about that on Monday as well. Uh, any questions about what's coming up before we start? Um, questions out of the book? Yes. Yeah, uh, I'll give you a little bit of re a review on Monday. Uh, some others have asked me, do I have like an old exam or something? And I can post an old exam. The one thing that's a little bit different is uh, this semester is a little bit more compressed than normal. And so I'm going a little bit further than I would for the first exam. Usually we would have our first exam after continuity. So this would be the last section before the exam. We're going just a little bit further, which is fine. Uh, but my old first exams don't cover those extra two sections. But I can usually post an old exam just so you can see one of my exams from the past and kind of be like, oh, that's about the level of question I should expect. So I can do that. I'll put one of those on Foxdale. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Uh, any homework questions? Yes, sir. 37. 37. Okay. So we're looking to evaluate. Thirty-seven. We have the limit. X goes to five of six times the square root x squared minus sixteen minus three divided by. I guess the six is around all multiplying all of that. Then we have five x minus twenty-five. And the direction is just evaluate each of these limits. Okay. So um, if we did plug in five, uh, the bottom would be zero, which is bad. The top would be what? 25 minus 16 is nine squared. It would be zero, right? So we would get zero over zero. So what we're hoping is that there's something we can do here to make life a little bit better. Uh, and since I have this square root, that makes me think that maybe multiplying by a conjugate here might be helpful to me. So what I wanna do is let's multiply on top and bottom by the conjugate of this top piece. So I'm gonna multiply by the square root of x squared minus 16 plus 3 on top, and I'll multiply by the square root of x squared minus 16 plus 3 on the bottom, which is really just multiplying this thing by 1. Yes? For this one, is there, is there a natural log? Is there a natural log? Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that makes it different. Yeah, there is. Thank you saying that okay so that changes things a little bit 
but not much. So if there was LN right here, okay, um, it doesn't make that much of a difference. I'm still getting kind of a zero over zero situation, right? Um, and one thing that you can do is if you have a natural log, you can move the natural log inside and outside the limit if you want to. So what I'm doing isn't wrong. The question is, do I need to do it? And I think that the answer is yes, although there's another way now that I, I could approach this problem. So one way that we could go is first split it up using the rules of natural log, that natural log of something divided by something is ln of the top minus ln of the bottom. Right, so that's another way we could approach the problem. The question is, does it help to do that? Uh, to because I'm I know that this is zero. What's ln of zero? What's that? Uh, it's the other way around. Ln of one is zero. Ln of zero does not exist. Does everybody agree with that? Yeah, there's no such thing as ln of zero. There's a limit as you get close to zero and it goes down to negative infinity. So I have to be a little bit careful of saying like ln of zero. So it's not like ln of zero minus ln of zero is gonna be any more helpful to me. So I kind of feel like, well, maybe this is still a good way to go. Now, one thing you can do though, is you can move limits inside of continuous functions. And so this limit could come inside of this LN. So I could write the LN here, or I could move the LN out here. Does that make sense? So if I wanted to, I could rewrite this with the LN outside, and maybe in this next iteration I will. So the LN can be outside, and then I could take the limit as X goes to five of, I think I still want to do this, and we'll see how it goes. Um, I have a six on top, then I multiply and I get this guy times this guy is, of course, um, x squared minus 16. And then I get three of the square roots and then minus three of the square roots, so those cancel. Then I get minus three times positive three, which is minus nine. And then on the bottom, I'm not going to multiply that out, I'm just going to leave it as is for now. So I get 5x minus 25. Um, let's see. Uh, and then I get square root of x squared minus 16 uh, plus 3. And the question is, was that helpful? Uh, okay, so what do we get on the top? Um, now, of course I could factor that, right? That's a 5x, uh, okay, I could factor a 5 out of this, and up here, yeah, I think I like what I've seen. So let's keep going. So we still have this ln sitting out here. Uh, I still have a limit, and as x goes to 5. On top, uh, this is 6 times... This is x squared minus 25, right? But that's the difference of square. So that's x minus 5 times x plus 5. Agreed? Okay. Uh, what's on the bottom? Okay, I could factor out a 5 from this thing. And if I did, I'd get 5 times x minus 5. And then over here, I still have this square root of x squared minus 16 plus 3. So the x minus 5s cancel. And I am left with ln of the limit as x goes to 5 of 6 times x plus 5 divided by 5 times the square root 
of x squared minus 16 plus 30. And now the question is, can I just plug in the 5? On the top, if I plug in 5, everything's fine. On the bottom, if I plug in 5, what do we get? We get uh, 25 minus 16 is 9. So, yeah, everything's fine. So I can go ahead and plug in the 5 at this point, and I get ln of, on top, I get 6 times 10, which is 60. And on the bottom, I get what? So 5 squared is 25, that's 9. 6 times 5 is 30. So I just end up with ln of 2. And that's it. Can we just write ln of 2? Yeah, ln of 2 is fine. Yeah, that's the answer. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions on this one? Okay, what's next? Yes. 43. All right, so we have functions with roots. So determine the intervals on which these functions are continuous, 43. Um, and we have f of x is equal to the square root of 2x squared minus 16. Square root of 2x squared minus 16. So we want to find where is it continuous and at which finite endpoints is it the is it continuous from the left or from the right? Okay, so first of all, we just want to say if I'm taking the square root of something, then that thing had better be positive, correct? Or zero, right? So what are the numbers that would make this thing positive or zero? So we know that two x squared minus 16 really needs to not be negative. Right, and now we could just solve for x, so to speak, and we get 2x squared is greater than or equal to 16, or x squared is greater than or equal to 8. So what would x have to be? Or where could X live in between what and what? Well, I, I suppose I could, so, so to speak, take the square root of both sides. But we have to be a little bit careful because if I square a negative number, it's positive. Right? So I could say that X, the very biggest that X could be is the square root of 8. Uh, just a second. Did I break this correctly? Let's see. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, we have to. So, what could X be? So, certainly, X could be uh, 8 uh, square rooted. Uh, x could be that, right? Uh, if you took the square root of 8 and squared it, you get 8, which is fine. Or it could be even bigger than the square root of 8. Right? So x could be greater than or equal to the square root of 8. And that would give me a number that x squared is greater than or equal to 8. But that's also true of values that are less than or equal to negative square root of 8. So if you take something like negative 10 and you square it, that's bigger than 8. Agreed? So if you looked on like a number line, down here is negative square root of 8. Up here is square root of 8. 
And it's fine for it to be both of those things, because that would just give you zero. And then it could be greater than or less than. Make sense? Then the question was, okay, um, let me do, 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 do. It says, determine the intervals on which the following functions are continuous. So if you wanted to write this as an interval notation, you could say that it's from minus infinity up to negative root eight. By the way, you could write negative root eight as, if you wanted to be more um, precise as negative two root two and it's continuous on two root two to positive infinity. So these are the intervals on which this function is continuous. And then the question is, are there places where it's continuous from the right or continuous from the left? Um, and so this thing's going to come in from the right to uh, square root of eight, or if you prefer, two root two, it's going to come in from the right. So this thing is going to be continuous from the right at x equals two root two. And this has values coming in from the left and hitting at negative two root two. So it's continuous from the left at negative two root two. So this is continuous from the right at x is equal to 2 root 2 and continuous from the left at x is equal to negative 2 root 2. And that's what we're looking for. So in some of these problems, especially with a square root, there's going to be some places where the function doesn't exist, but on these places where it's zero, it's only continuous from either the right or the left, but not both. So it's just saying, well, which is it for this problem? Okay. Yes. Uh, number 69. 69. Okay. Is everybody good with this one? Any other questions on this one? Okay. So for all of these types of problems, figure out where does the function actually exist. So all the other places it's non-continuous and then where is it just continuous on one side? Okay, 69. So 69 asks us, oh, this is intermediate value theorem. Okay. So we have x cubed. Oh, that's terrible. I'm trying to get a better pen. minus 5x squared plus 2x equals minus 1 at a point they give is negative 1, 5. And the question says, use the intermediate value theorem to show that the following equations have a solution on the given interval. Okay. So this is an interval, not a point. So on the interval negative one five, show that this thing has some root in between negative one and five. And a way to do that is you can set this equation up as a function. Okay, so let's do that really quick. So what I could do is that I could move the negative one to the other side. If I do, I get x cubed minus 5x squared 
plus 2x plus 1 equals 0. Right, so really now I have a problem where I'm saying where does this thing, this polynomial have a 0? So the way that I could deal with that is I could say, okay, let's write this polynomial as a function. This is x cubed minus 5x squared plus 2x plus 1. And now the question becomes, where is this function 0? Or is that function ever 0 between negative 1 and 5? Correct? And what the intermediate value theorem says is if somewhere it's below 0 and somewhere it's above 0, then somewhere in between, if it's a continuous function, it must hit 0. Right? So if I could show that one side of this interval has a functional value of a negative and one side of this interval has a functional value as a positive, then somewhere in between it must be zero by the intermediate value theorem. Okay, so what I'm going to do is let's plug in the endpoints. So let's ask what is f of negative one and what is f of five? So let's plug in minus 1, and I get minus 1 cubed minus 5 times minus 1 squared plus 2 times minus 1 plus 1. And what does that give me? This is minus 1. This is 1 times minus 5. Uh, this is 2 times minus 1, so minus 2, and then plus 1. So those cancel, and I get minus 7. Okay, so that side's negative. Uh, if I plug in 5, I get 5 cubed minus 5 times 5 squared uh, plus 2 times 5 plus 1. Uh, 5 cubed minus 5 cubed is 0. And so I get 10 plus 1, positive 11. So on one side, it's negative of this interval. On the other side, it's positive. So somewhere in between, it must be zero. So I can say so by the intermediate value theorem, uh, there exists a point C in the interval from negative one to five such that F of C is zero. Or I could say, and since that's true, that means there's something that I could plug in for X that C would give me that this thing has a solution. Another one or so, or uh, X cubed minus five X squared plus two X does equal negative one for some C in negative one to five. Okay, so for these intermediate value theorem problems, if you ever use a big theorem, you should probably say it in your answer. You know, don't just kind of get to here and say, so see it works. You know, and just say, see one side's negative, one side's positive, we're done. It's like, well, what? why are you done? Well, because of the intermediate value theorem, there must be something in between negative 1 and 5 where the function is 0. Okay. That was part A, right? Um, let's see. Uh, who asked this one? Yeah. Uh, do you need me to go on? Uh, um, let's see. So use a graphing calculator to give, and then... Um, to find all the solutions. Yeah. So yeah, this one is just like, just graph it. Okay. Uh, so take this function, graph that function, and then do the best you can zoom in and see about where those zeros should be in between negative one and five. Yeah, that's all I want you to do there. Okay, other questions? Yes, sir. 75. 75. 
Um, 75. Oh, fun. Okay. Seventy-five is on interest rates, and it says, "Suppose five thousand is invested in a savings account for ten years, with an annual interest rate of R compounded monthly. Okay, the amount of money in the account after ten years is given by A of R uh, is equal to five thousand, which is the principal." times one plus R over 12 to the 120th power. Okay, show that there is a value of R in, um, so interest rates, so basically our interval here is zero to um, 0 0.08. Okay. an interest rate between 0% and 8% that allows you to reach your savings goal of $7,000 in 10 years. Okay. Yes. So basically we would like to hit $7,000 in our account. So what this is saying is the amount in your account based on R, which is the interest rate, so R could change. It could be 5%. It could be 8%. It could be 2%. But the amount that's going to be in your account after 10 years is given by this formula if you know what the interest rate is. Does that make sense? So now the question is, is there an interest rate that will let your account be $7,000 exactly in 10 years? And is that interest rate somewhere in between zero and 8%? Okay, so what I could do is I could say, okay, let's plug in some things. Like I could plug in an interest rate of zero, which is a very bad interest rate, but I could plug in an interest rate of zero and see what comes out. And I could plug in an interest rate of 8% and see what comes out. But if, if the first side is something and the second side is something else and 7,000 is a number in between, then for some interest rate in between those two, it must hit 7,000, right? Because it's a continuous function. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna check it out. So what's the amount in the account after 10 years if I have an interest rate of zero? And what's the amount in the account after 10 years if I have an interest rate of 8%? And now, well, one of these is fairly simple. If I have an interest rate of zero, how much do we think will be in the account? $5,000, yeah, because this is zero, right? So that goes away. So I just get 5,000 times one to the 120th, which is just one. So I just get 5,000. Now I need to plug in 8%. So I get 5,000 times one plus, um, okay, uh, this is 0 0.08 divided by 12 to the 120. That I cannot do in my head, unfortunately. Uh, that is 11,098. 11,000. 98 like that Point two Point two zero. Yeah. sure and two dots <laughs> yeah uh that's good enough for me it's good enough for you it's bigger than seven thousand right that's the main thing is uh it would be bigger than seven thousand in fact it's over double your money right which is pretty nice um so uh that means that somewhere in between zero and eight percent there is a percentage rate where we would get 7,000 exactly. Okay, so we could say, so by the intermediate value theorem, there exists a 
uh, an R value in 0 to 0 0.08 in that interval such that A of that R is going to equal exactly 7,000. Okay. And I think that the second part of the problem is just say, okay, so, so what is it, right? Uh, so they say, just use a graph to illustrate your explanation and then approximate the interest rate required to reach your goal. So basically just take this function, graph it, look at it and see what would the R value have to be to achieve the 7,000? Okay, we could kind of like maybe do some things to figure this out algebraically, but they're just asking you to look at a graph and figure it out. Okay? Other questions? So yeah. You, you just graph the... Yeah, graph this. Of course, like A and R aren't going to work so well in your calculator. You'll probably have to change it to, this is X, R is X, and then this thing's Y, right? And then you'll get a graph, and you're going to say, well, what X value would give me a Y value of 7,000? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, when it says to find the graph to illustrate this, should we draw a sketch of the graph as well? Uh, let me see. Real quick, use a graph to illustrate. Yeah, if it says to illustrate, go ahead and draw it. Yeah, that's good. But you can use your graph and calculator and figure out what it looks like. Other questions? Yeah, 55. 55. Okay, evaluate each is the limit as x goes to pi over 2. Of sine x minus 1 divided by square root of sine x minus 1. is another fun little limit. Uh, well, this one's kind of mean-spirited in some ways, but what I would do here is I would say, let's take the limit as x goes to pi over 2. And we could write sine of x as uh, the square root of sine of x squared. Right? That's the same thing as sine of x minus 1 divided by square root sine x minus 1. And why would you write it that way? Well, because now the top is the difference of squares and we could factor it. So we could write this as the limit as x goes to pi over 2 of square root sine x minus 1 times square root of sine x plus 1 divided by square root of sine x minus 1. So the square root of sine x minus 1 is cancel. And I'm left with the limit as x goes to pi over 2 of square root sine x plus 1. And now we plug in the pi over 2, and we get sine of pi over 2 is what? 1. Yep. 1. Square root of 1 is 1. So we get 1 plus 1, or just 2.
question? You look like you have a question. I just don't know how, like, we're supposed to know that we're supposed to be getting. Oh, how to know to, like, factor the top? Yeah, because, like, I, I multiplied the bottom times the opposite. Oh, the conjugate. Yeah, the conjugate. Yeah. That way, but it still doesn't work. By multiplying by the conjugate? Yeah, it still gets. Uh, it should actually. That should have also worked. Let's do it really quick. I'll, I'll do it fast. Um, just so. So you're right. I did do it. That might have been. I, I'm not. Neither way is the better way. There are just two different ways. So you're saying you multiplied by square root sine x uh, plus one and square root sine x plus one. Correct. That's what you tried. Yeah. Okay. So let's try this and see what happens. So we get the limit as x goes to pi over two, uh, and I'm not going to do anything on the top. Okay. Whenever you do these conjugates, you're multiplying by the conjugate to make the bottom better, not to make the top better. And oftentimes it just like muddies the water if you multiply out the either the denominator or the numerator is the denominator where you're not actually trying to fix it. So just leave it as is. So on top, I'm just going to write this is sine x minus 1 times square root sine x plus 1. And on the bottom, I multiply this out and I get square root sine x times square root of sine x is sine x. And I get an then some things cancel, all right? I get positive square root of sine x. I get negative square root of sine x. They cancel. I get minus one times one, which is minus one. Now the sine x minus ones cancel. And I'm left with the limit as x goes to pi over two of square root sine x plus one which is sine of pi over two is one, square root of one is one, so this is one plus one, or just two. Sound good? So yeah, it does actually work either way. So I did. I don't know why I did it this way and not the way you did. They both work just the same. Other questions? Nobody has brought me a solution to the riddle yet, so I'm waiting patiently, <laughs> very patiently. Okay, so maybe, it, yeah, 39, sure. 39. This one we have kind of a piecewise function. We have f of x is equal to uh, either 2x uh, if x is less than 1 or it's x squared plus 3x if x is greater than or equal to 1. Okay, so what's the question? Use the continuity checklist to show that f is not continuous at the given value of a, and a is 1 in this case. <coughs> okay, so they're kind of saying, why is this thing not so continuous at a equals 1? Well, uh, the continuity checklist really is, okay, does it have a functional value of 1? Does it have a limit value of 1? Are those two things the same thing? So first of all, we could say, well, what is f of 1? So does it have a functional value at 1? And it seems everything's fine because if, if, a, if x is 1, I use this rule, and I just plug in 1, and I get 1 plus 3, 
and I get four. So check mark, right? Uh, it has a functional value. Then the question is, does it have a limit value? Uh, so what's the limit as X goes to one of this function F of X? Well, if I'm coming at it from the right side, maybe it would be worth it to just quickly draw a picture of this function. If X is less than one, this is two X. So two X, let's see, it starts here, it would be about here. So here's part of the function, right? And then the question is what happens here? We said it was four, so two, 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 one, two, three, four. So here it's actually at that point. And then um, what happens is it gets bigger. Um, so probably, yeah, everything just gets bigger, right? So it just goes up. So here's our function, or approximately what this function looks like. And now that we see it on a graph, can we answer the question, does this thing have a limit at one? It has a limit from the left, it has a limit from the right, but are those two things the same? No, so this thing does not exist. And that's bad. So in order to be continuous at a point, you have to have a functional value, you have to have a limit value, and those two need to be the same. I don't even need to check the third one because I already know uh, f of x is not continuous at a equals 1 because um, the, uh, the limit as x goes to 1 of f of x does not exist. And that's a good answer for that part. Let me see, was there another part to this? It says, uh, yeah, is it continuous at A? No. Determine whether F is continuous from the left or the right at A. Okay, so now the question is, is it continuous from the right or the left? It has a functional value. Now, does it have a limit value from the left? a limit value from the left. It does, it's two. Does it have a limit value from the right? It does, it's four. So is it continuous from the left or is it continuous from the right? Yeah, it's continuous from the right because it, at the left it has to match up with its functional value. Right, so from the left, we get a limit value of two, which is not four. And from the right, we get a limit value of four, which is four. So it's continuous from the right. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, is there another part here? Oh, state the intervals of continuity for that function. Well, basically, <clears throat> I guess it, that's funny because it's like, well, what do you mean by continuity? But I think what I'm going to say is it's not continuous, right, at one. But everywhere else on this function, it is continuous. So the intervals of continuity for this guy would be negative infinity, negative infinity up to one and from one to infinity. So it's just not continuous at one. Sound good. Any other questions? Okay, very good. Uh, if you want to check in on your riddle results, come talk to me. But if not, I, we will start talking about derivatives now. Uh, and so the next lecture you'll be watching is on the basics of the derivative. Uh, and so, like I said, You'll turn in homework summit today. 
you'll turn one in on Friday, you'll turn one in on Monday, and then our exam. Okay? Have a good day.